This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Welcome everyone. In this video I'm going to show you my new circuit, which is a CH32 microcontroller based development board. These CH32 chips have been also famous as the new Tencent RISC-V microcontrollers. The fun thing is that their insanely low price does not make them worse. They are packed with peripherals and they have a rather high CPU clock speed and a good amount of flash memory and RAM, but more on this later. When I calculate the bill of materials cost with the assumption that I assemble at least 10 boards, then the price per board cost, including the cost of the stencil, becomes less than $5. Now imagine manufacturing thousands or tens of thousands of these boards. The cost would be very low. As usual, I ordered the boards from PCBWay and this time I picked the red solder mask color. As you can see, it looks very good with the white silk screen. Similarly to most of my boards, I made the traces curved using a great KiCad plugin. The board is about 39 mm long and 21 mm wide and it has 2 times 15 pins. Its small size allows it to be used in breadboards while still leaving space for wires for connecting different things to it. If you want to get this exact same board, then head over to my PCBWay project page and order it now. Either you buy my board or you want to get yours manufactured, it is a good time to visit PCBWay's website now due to their ongoing 11 year anniversary celebration. They provide exclusive coupons and discounts not only for their well-established PCB-related services such as manufacturing and assembly, but also for their 3D printing, CNC machining and sheet metal fabrication services. It is the perfect occasion to get your complete project manufactured now. So head over to PCBWay's website and use the coupons and discounts they provide for your next project. To make the boards at home, it is a great help to use the stencils to spread the solder paste over the pads on the PCB. I ordered a 0.1mm thick stencil to make sure that I do not overflow the PCB's pads with solder paste. It is particularly useful for the microcontroller and the USB connector because their pins are placed very tightly. But in general, a stencil can speed up the pasting process by a lot. So now let's enjoy a little assembly footage where I show you how I made these nice boards into a working circuit.
So the boards are done. For now I made six of it, but I will probably finish the other four I have left because I have the parts for them. As I mentioned in the beginning, the cost of the parts are extremely cheap, so why not build a bunch of these boards? It is a good exercise anyway. As you can see, the board turned out to be very nice with all the parts in place. One thing I want to emphasize here about the board is its capabilities when it is compared to an Arduino Nano. I picked the Nano as a comparison because they are similar in price level when we look at the cost of a complete board and they are somewhat similar hardware wise. Also, none of them support USB natively, so they need to rely on an additional USB to use our chip to allow serial communication with the computer. However, when we take a closer look at the specifications, we will see some significant differences between the two chips. So to begin with, the Nano is only an 8-bit microcontroller, while the CH32 is, as its name suggests, a 32-bit microcontroller. Their CPU frequency differs a lot. The Nano's CPU only ticks at 16 MHz, while the CH32 ticks at 3 times higher 48 MHz clock frequency. While the Nano has 32 KB of flash memory, the CH32 microcontroller has almost twice as much, 62 kilobytes available. And this difference becomes even larger when we look at the RAM, because the Nano has 2 kilobytes, while the CH32 microcontroller has 8 kilobytes, so that's a 4 times difference. When we look at the GPIO pins, the difference is not that much. By default, the CH32 has 31 GPIO pins available, but on my board I reserved 6 for other purposes, so they are not available on the pins that I broke out from the microcontroller. So we are looking at 25 from the CH32 and 22 from the Arduino Nano. However, when we look at the peripherals, for example, we look at the ADC, then the Nano has only a 10-bit ADC, and it can only run at roughly 10 kHz, if my research was correct. However, the CH32 has a 12-bit ADC, and it can run up to 3 MHz, so 3 million samples per second. And this is a significant difference. Also, when we look at the user peripherals, the Nano has only one, and that is already occupied if we want to communicate with it via USB. However, the CH32 has two. So even though I'm using one of the USARTs to allow USB communication between the chip and the computer, I still have one more left on the board. Also, when we look at the interrupts, the Arduino Nano only has two pins available where we can use the interrupts, for example, for a button. But the CH32 allows all its GPIOs. So theoretically, you can use all the 31 GPIOs to assign interrupt to it. Also due to the architectural differences, you can see, for example, a significant difference between the two boards in power consumption, because the Nano, first of all, runs at 5 volts and it consumes 19 milliamps. However, the CH32 runs at 3.3 volts in my board and it consumes only 4.4 milliamps. So that is almost a 5 times difference in power consumption. And of course, we cannot be sure about the board's condition until we test them. So first I'm using a USB tester circuit to see how much current is being drawn by the board. Since I thoroughly inspected all the solder joints under a microscope, I'm fairly confident that there are no short circuits, so that's why I'm not using an external power supply with the current limit first. However, I still want to see what's the current draw of the circuit in case something is still off and I missed it. I fully prepared one of the boards and soldered the pin headers in it, so I can plug it in in a regular breadboard. I used this board as the test board for the rest of the demonstration. As I plugged it in, the power LED on the board lit up, and the USB tester showed 4 milliamps of current draw. If you recall the power consumption of the chip, which I just mentioned, then this value perfectly reproduces that value. So we can be almost 100% sure that the board is functioning. But of course the real test would be to plug it in in the computer, and upload some code to it, so we can see if it really works as it should. So now I prepared everything, and I prepared everything in advance, because now I just only want to show you the functionality of the microcontroller, and I want to show you that it works. So what I did is that you can see that we have a breadboard here, and it has uh, different components on it. So first I explained that. You can see that there are two LEDs, and I'm testing the functionality of the GPIOs with that, one of the LEDs has its GPIO pin set up as a source, and the other is set up as a sink. So when the GPIO is enabled or disabled, one of the LEDs will turn on, and the other LEDs will turn off, because that's how I uh, coded it. But the main purpose here is that I wanted to check if I can 
both source and uh, sync current through the GPIOs, but uh, it's just the basic toggling. And then uh, you can see a push button here as well. It is set up in a way that it has a pull-up resistor on its uh, GPIO pin, so by default it is at a high level, but when I press the button, then the button shorts this GPIO pin to ground, so its state will be low. And uh, this high to low edge is captured by an interrupt, and then uh, it will do something. So here I can test the interrupt function. And what it will do is that it will print a message on the serial terminal. So actually I'm also testing both the onboard uh, USB to serial chip, which is right there, but I'm also testing uh, the USART functionality of the chip itself. Because what happens is that the microcontroller sends out the serial message to this USB to serial converter, and then that converter will send it out to the computer via USB. And then you can also see a small OLED display, which can be familiar to you from my earlier tutorials. And that uh, OLED display will just show some numbers. But the main purpose here is to check if the I2C works or not. So as I said, the code consists of my earlier codes mixed uh, together into one single tutorial. So I'm not even sharing this code and I'm not even explaining it because it's totally irrelevant for like programming purposes or whatever purposes, because these are already discussed uh, in my earlier tutorials. So I'm just going to show you what is the expected behavior. So at the top here, you can see that uh, there is a significant delay and that is just added. So it allows me to plug in the microcontroller into one of the USB ports and then I can start uh, the serial terminal and then I can see this exact message which is uh, shown here. And then this message is uh, there for like five seconds as you can see it in this line. And then uh, we enter this infinite loop here. And what happens in this loop is that we print the value of the counter which is zero initially on the serial port. And then we do the same but on the display. So we print the same counter variable on the display. And then if this number can be divided by two, so it's an even number, then we set uh, the LEDs according to these uh, statuses. And uh, what is interesting here is that since one of the ports, uh, or more specifically, one of the pins are set up uh, as a source and the other is set up as a sink, they will behave in the opposite way. So for example, in this branch here, when the PC0 is set to reset, then uh, it will be set to zero. And since it's a sourcing pin, it will not source any current. So that LED will be dark. But the PC3, so the next line here, is set up as a sync. And when a syncing pin is set to zero, then it means that it is allowed to kind of accept current through it. So when I set that pin to zero, it will turn on the LED. And then the opposite happens in the else. So when we have an odd number, then the sourcing pin is set to set, which is high, then the LED will turn on and the syncing pin is also set to high. So the LED will turn off. And uh, down here, we can see that there is a flag, which we check if the button pressed is one, then its status is reset. And again, we are printing something on the serial terminal. And what this does is the following. Down here, we have a interrupt handler and uh, that changes the button pressed variables value to one. So then uh, when it's time in the main loop here to check the value of this flag, and if the interrupt changed uh, this flag to one, then we tell the user via the serial terminal that uh, we press the button. Uh, so this is again uh, two functions or two functionalities in one, uh, let's say, function or one piece of code that we take care of the interrupt and then we also communicate via USART. So here I prepared uh, the serial terminal and you can also see uh, the breadboard. And what I will do is that uh, I will plug uh, the USB cable in into the USB port and then uh, the device will appear here and then within 10 seconds we should uh, see a message here and then we should see the counting going up both in this terminal and on the display on the breadboard. 
So let me plug this in and let's see how the things work. So the message is received and now the counter goes up. So what you can see that in the terminal we have the counting going upwards every half a second and the same numbers appear on the display here as well. And then you can see that uh, the LEDs blink in the opposite way there because of their pin status. And we have the button that we have to check. So I press the button and you can see that we have a serial message here because the interrupt picked up the change of the pin and then it allowed the code to print uh, this message on the serial terminal. So as you can see it happens once and then uh, that's all. So now we can see that the circuit works as expected and uh, based on the conclusions of uh, this very simple test I dare to say that uh, the other peripherals and the other functionalities should work as well. So that's very nice. And uh, also by developing this board, it allows me to continue my tutorial series on the CH32 microcontrollers a bit more because this board has more peripherals and I can show them how you should program them and how you should or how you can use them uh, for your projects. So once again, don't forget to visit PCBWay's website and also my PCBWay project page if you are interested in this PCB because I shared it there so you can go and directly buy it from my PCBWay project page. And also don't forget to visit my website, link is in the description. I wrote a nice article about this hardware and its development and I also uploaded some extra pictures and resources which might be interesting for you. So I hope that this video was useful for you and you learned something and see you in the next video.